Good evening. Welcome to an evening with Winston Scott, Reflections from Earth Orbit. And on behalf of the Office of Student Life, our planetarium, as well as our um, QEP and our Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning, we gladly welcome each of you all um, for a spectacular night. And it is so good to see so many of our young people here because I remember when I was a student in college, one of the aha moments for me was not only what I learned inside the classroom, but also what took place outside of the classroom. And so hopefully tonight we will create a moment that you will never forget on February 28, 2018, that you were inspired to be something greater. Before we start, Seminole State College is a fine member now of a wonderful organization that we've just joined as institutional members, and that membership is called OSLA, which stands for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And we are Partner, we've partnered with UCF. They are the only other institution member in the Central Florida area, and we're grateful for this partnership with this fine organization. As we end Black History Month, we thought it would be great to bring Winston in, as well as pay our respect for the many, many fine African Americans who have played, who have made great contributions to our history. We have a wonderful treat with us tonight. Before I bring up Winston Scott, we have a poet. And she's right here from Seminole County. And her name is Valela Llewellyn. And let me tell you about Valela. She's an author, poet, curator, storyteller. She first published a book, Poetically Just Us, in 1990. Since then, she was, has published four other books, The Mosquito, African Americans of Sanford, Jack and Jill of America into the New Millennia, The History of the Oldest African American Family Organization, published in 1999. And she is currently writing an update of the Jack and Jill History book to be published in July for the organization's 80th anniversary. Her exhibits in museums include Intercolored Hats, Praise, Reach, and Teach, and A Pilot Lights the Way, a tribute to Jesse Lee Brown, the first AA Naval Aviator. She is a proud member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Incorporated, and past president of the Sanford Historical Society. And she's married to her husband, Thomas Fluella, and they have three children and four grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please welcome Valena Fluella. Thank you, Gerald. Before we get started, I want us to just together do a poem in the African tradition of call and response. I'm going to say a line, and then if you'll just repeat after me. The name of the poem we're going to do is called, What's Right? Say that. <laughs> By Valeda Fluellen. What's right in America? Let's start with you and me. and me. There are problems in America. Problems in America. We're, the answer, We're the answer you see. There is a job to do. Job. We each must play a part. In keeping America number one. 
We are like blood in America's heart. We are all important. We are individually unique. We must all work together to get the rewards we seek. Each one helping the other. Each one doing his part. We are the blood in America's heart. Our skin may vary in color. Our cultures may not be the same. But we are the blood in America's veins. There is something right in America. That something is me and you. We can make this country great by the things we say and do. Now say, all right. All right. Great, great. welcome you to the 2008 history celebration that honors our country's accomplishments in science, technology, art, and math education. On behalf of Seminole State and the Central Florida branch of the Dorothy T. Jerner branch of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, I welcome you. I'd like to speak on behalf of Gerald Jones from Seminole State, Janet Bolinoff from Seminole State, and our founder and president, Karen Anamopoulos. And I'd like for Karen to stand if she is here in the audience. I thought I saw her a moment ago. This is our <laughs> founder and president, Karen Anamopoulos. The namesake for the branch of, for our branch of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, Dorothy Turner Johnson, was born in 1915, the same year that historian Carter G. Woodson founded the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. The association became the premier organization for the research study and dissemination of information on the African American. The organization is the founder of what was Black History Week and is now celebrated as Black History Month. Dorothy Turner Johnson died in 2015 during the centennial of the organization's founding and it was her 100th birthday. She was among the first black women to serve in the armed forces. She was enlisted in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, which became the Women's Army Corps. She served in France with the famous 688 Postal Unit under the well-known Sergeant Charity Adams. Now, history is often overlooked, sometimes kicked aside, buried in our hearts, our minds, never to confide. Then history has no purpose. And like an old tossed shoe, it's of very little value to me or to you. But this evening, we are here in celebration as we place in indelible ink our most valued history, as we honor and pay tribute to a most valuable link. 
Captain Winston Scott, Naval Pilot, Astronaut. I offer the following poem, penned in his honor. A pilot in turbulent skies, he flew, weathering storms of injustice, clouds of prejudice, fogs of inequity, winds of change. He flew, a gallant beacon of light who entered the cockpit with authority and took flight, opening doors that others might. He flew, naval pilot, astronaut, Captain Winston Scott, an aviation legend. With confidence and reverence, he continues to pray, knowing God, a pilot, lights the way. Introducing Captain Winston Scott. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Can I get a copy of that? I would love to. Okay, yeah. Good evening, and thank you very, very much. Thank you for that warm welcome, and thank you, uh, Valeda. Uh, Ms. Fluellen and I go back several years. We worked on a project together. Actually, she worked on the project, and I hosted it at Florida Tech about the life of Jesse Brown. Ensign Jesse Brown was the very first African-American naval aviator. So we got acquainted back then, and it's so good to see her t tonight. And that is a wonderful poem, and I do want to get a copy of that so that I can keep it for myself. So thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing this evening? Good, good, good. I thought I had a clicker up here someplace, but I don't see it. Yeah, here it is. I have a, uh, a program I'm going to do for you. I have some slides and videos and things that I'm going to show you about my experiences in space. But I'm going to do this in a rather expeditious manner because when I do these presentations, I've found that the most fun part is when you get to talk back to me. I always say that, but it's true. I think people will enjoy that the most. So I'm going to leave as much time as I can for some two-way interaction. So while I'm doing the presentation, please go ahead and think of anything you may have wanted to ask about flying in space or any other subject because we can talk about it later on. I said any other subject because I get questions about leadership, and this is at the end of African American History Month. We can talk about that. Anything at all you want to talk about, go ahead and think about it because you'll get a chance to ask me here in just a little bit. Okay, first slide. Here we go. Uh, I normally don't talk a lot about my personal background. I usually go only into the space program, but I figured I would do that for tonight because, again, African American History Month, just to show you my humble beginnings, this is my family way back in the 50s. My mom and dad, of course, and, and they're gone. They're no longer with us. And the, the young girl here in the middle was my big sister. She has been retired for many years, retired from teaching school for over 40 years. And then the little dude right there is my baby brother. He is also retired. He was a deputy sheriff on the Atlanta, Georgia Sheriff's Department. And then look at me. Aren't I cute? Don't you just want to hug me? <laughs> But no, seriously, again, way back in the 50s, so time goes on. Uh, fast forward, this is the graduation night of high school. After the ceremony, we just took this picture in my living room. Fast forward again, I've graduated from college. I've been in the Navy for several years now, flying airplanes. I'm being promoted, and I'm being promoted to lieutenant commander. For those who don't na know Navy ranks, it's a uh, major in the Air Force or the Army. And of course, this is my commanding officer and uh, yours truly. Now, take a look at that picture. Don't I look exactly the same now as I did back then? Yeah, all right, you guys are good, absolutely. So, uh, I, I've had the experience of, of flying many, many different vehicles a, in my life. And uh, I'm really proud of the fact that in, in addition to being a regular airplane pilot, I also have helicopter experience. The Navy sent me through helicopter training, and I flew this aircraft. This is called the SH-2 
Foxtrot. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you, but it's an anti-submarine warfare helicopter, and I flew it off the back of destroyers. Now, if you think flying a fighter is hard, landing this thing on the back of a destroyer at night is really, really tough. There, there are people in the world that like to do ugly things, and those people in the world have submarines. And we have to have forces to detect, track, and counteract those submarines, and that's what we did with this vehicle. We had a full array of sensors. We carry torpedoes, so I've dropped torpedoes from a, sub, from a, a helicopter. Again, no real war, thank goodness, exercise torpedoes only, but got a chance to, to be fully qualified in helicopters. Most of my experience in the Navy is in this airplane. This is the F-14 Tomcat. Those of you who know airplanes, you know this airplane. Those of you who don't know airplanes, you know this airplane because it's the one featured in the movie Top Gun. And everybody in the world has seen Top Gun. In fact, you can turn on cable TV at any point, 24 hours a day, and flip through the channels, and somewhere on that TV is Tom Cruise in Top Gun. Well, this is the airplane that the Cruise character flew in the movie. I flew it for real. This is actually, and obviously it's a real picture, and uh, I just landed from a test flight at a Navy laboratory up in Warminster, Pennsylvania. And uh, I don't remember exactly why they were standing there to take this picture, because normally nobody comes out to take your picture after you land. I suspect it was because I had just been selected by NASA for astronaut training. This is where I was stationed when I was selected, and I suspect the reason they took this is, is because uh, I uh, been selected for astronaut training. But anyway, I just landed in the Tomcat and, uh, at, in Warminster, Pennsylvania back in the 90s. And let's see, two space shuttle missions, nine days on Endeavor with these folks here. Endeavor was the newest of the space shuttles. 16 days on Columbia. Columbia was the oldest. I got to fly on the newest and the oldest. Six guys here, five guys and one woman. An international cruise. Notice we had a Japanese astronaut on this flight. Japanese astronaut. We had a Ukrainian cosmonaut. This young woman here is from India, Dr. Kalpana Chavala from India. Let me pause here because girls, young ladies in the audience, just because you see one woman, don't think that space is just guy stuff because it's not. We have many, many women in the space program. As a matter of fact, I was just at a meeting yesterday with a good friend of mine, Ellen Ochoa. Ellen is Hispanic female, Dr. Ellen Ochoa. Ellen is a four-time space shuttle astronaut. She is the director of the Kennedy Space Center right now. So I want you to be sure that young ladies think about going into engineering, science, aviation, astronauts, and so on. Okay, let's see what's next. Everybody on the space shuttle had many things that they were responsible for, but you have some primary jobs also. One of my primary duties was flight engineer for the flying stuff. The space shuttle was operated by three people, the pilot, the command, and the flight engineer. So because of my pilot background, I was part of the flight deck crew. But my main job was spacewalking, or EVA, extravehicular activity. So I got to put the suit on and go outside. Now, the way we train for that is underwater because as you know, there is no such thing as a zero gravity practice room. You can't go inside, turn gravity off. So what we do is we put on a mock-up of the space suit and we practice underwater what we're going to do in orbit. The water sort of floats the suit and you pretend you're in weightlessness. Not the same thing, but that's the best we can do. Now, this picture up here is before we went into the water. Notice I have, I have on everything but the helmet. I'm on this side of the donning stand. My buddy is on the other side. We always go outside in a pair because once you're out there, you're on your own. People inside can't help you. you you're strictly on your own. So we want two people out there to get the job done and also for mutual support. That suit weighs 350 pounds. Those straps are attached to a crane. So we'll get closed up in the suits. The crane will pick us up and lower us into the water. What you don't see are all the scuba divers under there. The divers are under there to help us to practice and train for what we're going to do, and they're, un they're there to help us if something goes wrong. You can't swim in a 350-pound suit, so you need the scuba divers to get you out of the water. So we spend many, many hours underwater practicing for what we're going to do in orbit. Now, space is an amazing place. I was telling an audience this afternoon, in space, you can separate weight from mass. You can't necessarily do that here on Earth. Things that are massive, 
down here are also heavy. For example, your car. A car is massive, it's big, and it's also heavy. Things that are heavy are, pretty, are usually big. In space, that they weigh nothing, but you have all of that mass that you have to move around. So I've got a 350 pound suit, plus my body mass, plus tools and so on that we move around in space. So uh, space walking by is the most physically demanding thing that we do in orbit. Okay, let's jump ahead and let's see what else is next. This is my Columbia crew in front of our T-38s. As you know, I, I talked about, I love flying. I love flying airplanes. I still fly, as a matter of fact, a lot. These are our T-38s. Those are the airplanes that we use for travel and for training. Now, how many of you know all U.S.-based astronauts live in Houston? Houston, Texas, that's right. Not Cocoa Beach. That's right, yeah, you watch I Dream of Genie. And those old crazy astronauts live in Cocoa Beach. Real astronauts live in Houston. I could get up in the morning in Houston and jump in this thing. Hour and a half later, I'm landing in, in uh, Kennedy Space Center. At the end of the day, jumping that thing, an hour and a half, I'm landing back in South Houston. So there's no way in the world you could do that on an airliner. But uh, these babies are fast. But look, at it. it looks like a little sports car, doesn't it? It's fast. You outrun everything in the sky in that bad boy. I thoroughly enjoy it. This picture is the Columbia crew on the morning of launch. We just finished breakfast. We're going to leave the breakfast table, get our weather brief, get our launch and entry suits on, and go out to the launch pad where the shuttle is prepared for us. This is probably six hours before actual liftoff. Now we've jumped ahead. We've finished our weather brief. We have like our launch and entry suits. These are the suits we wore when we launch into orbit and when we re-enter from orbit. Once you're up there, you're in a shirt sleeve environment, just like you are in this room, except when we do a spacewalk, obviously. Anyway, we're leaving crew quarters. We have been quarantined in crew quarters for eight days. During the quarantine period, you only eat what's prepared for you by the dietitians. only come in contact with people who have been cleared by the medical doctors. Do you have a dietitian program here at Seminole State? Okay, well anyway, that's a good career field for people, registered, licensed dietitians. They prepare our food for us. Okay, we're going to board the crew transport vehicle and ride out to the launch pad where the shuttle is waiting for us. This is probably four and a half or five hours before actual liftoff. We jump ahead again. We're at the launch pad. It's my turn to climb in. That is the hatch to Columbia. This is called the White Room, and it leads from the gantry all the way across to the actual shuttle itself. These guys are suit technicians. They'll get me partially dressed, and then there's another person inside to help me get strapped in because the vehicle sat up on its tail. Remember, space shuttle? You had to climb in and sort of wiggle up into your seat with your feet up in the air, and you need somebody to help you get strapped in. So there's a person inside that can help you do that. They get your helmet on, get your gloves on, get your suit plugged in, get all that stuff taken care of so that you can prepare a launch. This is probably four hours, three and a half or four hours before actual liftoff. Now, we jump ahead. This is the liftoff. This is Columbia, my flight, seven seconds before liftoff. The ground launch sequence and computer will light the main engines, the space shuttle main engines. If all three ignite properly and come up to speed, then the solid rocket boosters will ignite. Now, once the solids ignite, there's no turning back. You are going somewhere. <laughs> this looks like slow motion on, on the movie there. In real life, it jumps off the pad. It sort of kicks you in the back, and it's vibrating and shaking. By the time you pass the top of the launch tower, you have exceeded 100 miles per hour. We pass Mach 1, the speed of sound, in roughly 45 seconds and it just goes faster and faster and faster and faster. I remember my first flight and second flight watching my gauges and I could see Mach 2, Mach 5, Mach 7, Mach 8, Mach 10, Mach 12. It just continues to accelerate. It pushes you back into your seat at about three times your body weight. It takes only eight and one half minutes to go from Earth to orbit. So we go from zero miles per hour on the pad to 17,500 miles per hour in only eight and one half minutes. On my first flight, we launched at night. So it was dark outside, obviously. But about halfway through the ascent, I could look out and see the day half of the Earth coming as we were accelerating around the Earth to orbit. So it is absolutely an incredible ride, eye-watering, 
to say the least. Nothing else like it on earth. But it's a rocket, and that's what it's supposed to do. Now, I'm going to pause for just a minute and digress, because people always want to know what are the requirements to become an astronaut. Well, education, obviously. Astronauts major in all kinds of scientific fields, but primarily engineering. Astronauts are pilots. Astronauts are physicists. Astronauts are meteorologists, doctors. But astronauts also are fashion gurus. <laughs> and here we are on Columbia's flight deck modeling our lucky shirts. That is the second ugliest shirt we could find in the Land's End shirt catalog. The ugliest one in the catalog was sold out. <laughs> so we bought the ugliest one we could find. That's our lucky shirt. And that's a real picture taken uh, from Columbia's flight deck with our lucky shirts on. This is one of the payloads that we took into space with us, a uh, satellite, a Spartan uh, solar observation satellite. This thing weighs 3,000 pounds, so it's about the size of a small car. And uh, our job was to take it into orbit, and, the, and Dr. Chavla there, we, her name was Kalpana Chavla. We called her KC. KC used the robot arm in the space shuttle, that's the robot arm there, to lift the satellite up out of the bay and place it into orbit. We initialized it. Then we were going to back away from it for 48 hours, during which it would make measurements of the sun's corona. Then we would fly back up to it. She would use the robot arm to grab it, put it back in the bay, and we'd bring it home. After the mission, scientists could download its data and learn more about the sun. Well, the satellite malfunctioned. And during the, in its malfunction, it developed a slow spin in space. So you've got a 3,000-pound satellite very slowly turning in space. And because it didn't initialize properly, we had to figure out how to get it back, bring it home, refurbish it, and so on. And we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. In the meanwhile, meantime, we'll jump ahead in the mission. And uh, this gentleman here is Dr. Takao Doi, Japanese astronaut. Takao is my spacewalking buddy. He and I are in the airlock preparing to go outside on our first spacewalk. Now, Takao was on his first space flight, so he's a rookie spacewalker. I was the lead spacewalker on my second flight. Before we put the spacesuit on, though, we had to put on the appropriate undergarment. This thing is called a liquid cooling and ventilation garment. And what it does is help stabilize your body temperature as you go around the Earth. See, we go around the Earth every 90 minutes. So you've got 45 minutes in direct sunlight, and the temperature is hot, 250 degrees or thereabout Fahrenheit. On the dark side of the Earth, the temperature can be minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So to stabilize your body temperature, we put on this liquid cooling and ventilation garment, and then we put the space suit on, on top of that, and the two connect together, and they circulate conditioned water up and down your body to stabilize the body temperature. So you see, I've got everything on but my helmet, Now I've got the big backpack there, I've got a computer on the front of the suit, microphones, headphones. Look how big and bulky those gloves are. All of your tools that you use outside have to be specially designed so that you can handle them with those big, thick, pressurized gloves. So we're in the airlock, we'll get our helmets on, get the suits all uh, up plugged in and turned on, and we'll depressurize the airlock and go outside. Now, there's a whole lot more to it than I'm telling you, but in the interest of time, I could condense it this way. Here's a picture of Takao and uh, me outside with the full suits on. I'm over here on the left, he's on the right, and you can see the backpack and helmet and so on. What we're doing here is, is actually Takao is testing this crane. This thing here is a portable crane it folds up and stows under the sill of the shuttle. It won't stand up under its own weight on Earth, but in space, it's designed to move hundreds of pounds of mass. So we're testing it for the first time right here in orbit to see how well it will move masses around in space. We're on the dark side of the orbit. That's orbital sunrise. The shuttle is flying backwards. This picture was taken through the rear window. That's the tail of the shuttle. It gets flying backwards away from you into the screen. Okay, space shuttle was not like an airplane. Airplanes always have to fly forward, right? Or they fall out of the sky. Space shuttle is not like that in orbit. You can fly it backwards, sideways, upright, any way you wanted to fly it. So we typically turn it around and fly it backwards for several reasons. If this were moving, you'd see the sun peek up over the horizon there. And, uh, and then 45 minutes later, we'd see the sun uh, set. 
how do you tell us apart in space? My suit has stripes. The stripe on the leg there, and his suit is clean. Otherwise, we look, look just like uh, one person looks just like the other. Let's see. Rem remember the satellite. The way we got it is the cow and I had to go out and catch it by hand. So I'm on the left of your screen. He's on the right. There's the satellite there. Our commander has flown us up to it. We've rotated the shuttle. I grabbed my end. He has his end. We're rotating it forward to lock it into the payload bay and bring it home. Notice the Earth is vertical to us. When we were doing this, it was so disorienting. As we were rotating the shuttle, out of the corner of my eye, I could see the Earth begin to tilt. And I felt as I was falling. And instinctively, I tried to right myself. Couldn't do it because I'm fastened to the shuttle. So the Earth continued to tilt like that. I'm getting more and more vertigo. But we worked our way through it. We caught the satellite, brought it back home, and it was refurbished. Now again, you're seeing 15, 20 seconds of what it took three and a half hours to do. There were days and days of planning and discussion that went into this, and it took three and a half hours to catch it. We weren't sure we were going to be able to do that. The satellite has sharp edges on it. You had to be careful where you touch. You can imagine what happens if you cut a glove in space. Takao was visiting from Japan. Our State Department had to get permission from the Japanese government to let him go do this. So there's a whole lot more to it. Well, this is definitely one of those defining moments that come up in life where you decide where you're going to, whether you're going to do something or whether you're not going to do it. And as the lead spacewalker, it was my decision as to whether or not we were going to do this or not. But we did. We got it. We brought it home. It was refurbished and sent up on a subsequent mission. Now, I'm going to digress a little bit here again. I already told you about the lucky shirts, and I told you some of the science, the payloads that we carried with us. This picture here has no scientific value to it. It's just a fun picture. I was at the end of a spacewalk floating up to the rear window, waving in the window, and they took this picture. No big deal, except this picture turns up everywhere. If you Google me, this picture will come up. It's on bookmarks, mouse pads, posters. It's in coffee table books. You ever been to somebody's house, found a coffee table book, look in the index, find your name, turn it page in the picture? I have, that picture. That's right. It was in the Museum of Science in London, England, blowing up to 12 feet, that picture. And how many of you remember those fans you get in church where you, you fan like this? It's been on those church fans. <laughs> if your picture can be on a church fan, it can be anywhere. So I like to leave this picture in here because I just have a lot of fun with it. It comes up everywhere but I haven't figured out yet how to get any, any royalties from it. So, if you know something about royalties, see me afterwards and we'll split the take. We're at the end of our mission now. We've done what's called the deorbit burn. We've left orbit, we're re-entering the atmosphere, and at one point we're going so fast that the air actually ionizes outside. Somewhere on my Mach 20, 20 times the speed of sound, and that bright glow you see there is just hot plasma. The temperature varies. The hottest part out there is 3,000 degrees. We're comfortable inside. We have the environmental control and life support system working. Our suits are on. The thermal protection system is protecting the shuttle. Otherwise, that plasma would burn it up. It would destroy the shuttle. But thermal protection system works properly. We're comfortable inside. And then if we jump ahead another uh, 30 or 40 minutes, we're over here at Kennedy Space Center getting ready to land. And this is a view through the front windscreen as we fly the shuttle to landing. Of course, our commander is actually doing the flying. There's the runway there. You saw the, all the flight data. This is picture from the outside to show you how steep it is, a very, very steep approach, seven times steeper than a regular airliner on landing. But it was a big glider. We had to come all the way from orbit on the opposite side of the Earth and land with no engines. There's airspeed there, there's altitude there. R is radar altimeter. The pilot lowers the landing gear, and our command does a nice smooth landing in bringing us back from orbit. The landing feels just like an airliner. It's just nice and smooth when it touches down. Now, we land at right over 200 miles per hour, so it's pretty high landing speed. Have a parachute in the back that we use to help slow us down. And uh, when this thing rolls to a wheel stop, as we say, you can't just open the door and get out the way you do an airliner. 
it takes three of us on the flight deck about 45 minutes to power down all of its systems. The commander had some, pilot had some, and I had some, and we systematically turned things off and power down the systems of the orbiter. At the same time, the ground crew will come out on a, with a convoy of trucks, and they'll plug in external power. So as we turn off electrical power from the shuttle, they turn on ground power. We turn off air conditioning from the shuttle, they'll turn on ground air conditioning, and so on. And at a certain point, we're done, we will leave the space shuttle, and then another astronaut will come on there and continue to power down the systems while we reacclimate to being back on Earth. It takes about 45 minutes for us to do our part. We open the hatch. The first person is the doctor. Flight surgeon wants to come in, talk with us, see how we're doing. If everybody's doing okay, then we leave the shuttle in seclusion. You've never seen astronauts actually walk off the space shuttle because it's done in seclusion. Some people don't walk so well, don't walk as well as others. And then, as I said, uh, we, when we leave, another astronaut will go in and take over the space shuttle. And if we're doing okay, a couple of hours later, we may come back out and we take pictures and shake hands and thank the ground crew for giving us a safe flight into orbit and back. And you can see us, six happy faces back from 16 days in orbit. Now, that concludes the actual presentation that I want to make, what I want to do now, and I think I have some help, is open up the floor and let's have some two-way conversation and we can talk about flying in space or anything else that you may want to talk about. Now we have some microphones I think that they're going to bring around to you so that everybody can hear the questions that you may want to, want to ask. So the best thing may be uh, to share the microwave the microwave, the microphone, and um, I'll pass it down to this gentleman in the front row, my, my friend from the student center earlier. Thank you. Uh, my question is when, uh, when you are ascending, going into the orbit, how do you know you have arrived? How do I know we have what? You have arrived at the Earth orbit. Oh, okay. What you have is a, you have a target that you're trying to make. The target is a point in space. You want to arrive at that point at the proper attitude, at the proper speed. We want main engine cutoff, MECO as we call it. We have a MECO target that is 25,800 feet per second. That's our velocity. We have left the atmosphere so Mach number doesn't mean anything. So if you hit that target, then you know you have arrived where you want to be. Now that's not all, because once you arrive in orbit, you have to adjust your orbit. When you get there, you're naturally in an elliptical orbit. Any algebra students in, you know what an ellipse is, right? Ellipse kind of looks kind of like a football. So your orbit is kind of one side, lopsided. You have to circularize your orbit because you want a perfect circle around the Earth and you may have to raise or lower your altitude. So you launch, you hit that MECO target, then you know you've arrived in orbit, you're safe there, then you adjust your orbit up or down and adjust the shape of your orbit so that you can stay there for 16 days or nine days or whatever. So velocity is the key. You hit your target on velocity. We'll take a question from one of the kids on this side. But to put this spaceship on, can you repeat that? One, one more time. I heard something about the spaceship. L l once more, slower and clearer. What was the question? Um, is it hard to put um, the space suit? Yeah. Yes, it is hard. You have to have somebody help you because the suit is so big and bulky and heavy. We need people to help us put it on. Yeah, again, that suit weighs 350 pounds. This big and massive and very difficult to put on. It sure is. Captain Scott, when you're doing your underwater training here on Earth, uh, how, uh, when you breathe, are you just doing normal breathing? Normal yes. Aspiration? The suits we wear underwater are obviously are mock ups of the real suit, and it is a hose, an oxygen hose that supplies air to you, okay. absolutely underwater. And for that, we have to have scuba qual. So anybody, any scuba divers in the audience? Yeah, I had to get a scuba qual to, to do the underwater training. So I got my open water one in the whole bit because we're training underwater and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Where else? Your turn. Uh, 
What was the most beautiful thing you saw in space? The most beautiful thing we saw in space was Earth. <laughs> I'm serious, yeah. And not because I was away from it, but the Earth is so bright and colorful from space, you have no idea how pretty the Earth is. The oceans are different colors depending on how deep the water is and what's dissolved in it. Sometimes it's really, really deep blue. Sometimes it's greenish. Along the shore, it may be some white silt in the water. And as you go around the earth, you cross uh, oceans and continents all in just a few minutes. And all the continents are incredibly bright and pretty. I re especially remember Africa, approaching the continent of Africa. And I could see the entire continent as we approached. I could see South Africa down there. I could see the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert itself is very pretty. If you see desert on TV, people trapped in the desert, it's just all this brown sand. In reality, there's a lot of red in the desert. There's a lot of orange in the desert, some black. As a matter of fact, the orange part, sand dunes in the desert are miles apart. In, from space, they look like or, an orange peel with just the little bumps on it, the sand dune. So the Earth is uh, incredibly bright and pretty and colorful from space. Captain Scott, could you uh, share some reflection on the loss of Columbia? On, I'm sorry? On the loss of Columbia. Well, yes. Uh, the, for those who don't know, we lost Columbia in an accident back in 2003, I guess it was. Columbia accident. Anyway, I knew all the astronauts on Columbia because they were my contemporaries. In fact, the one woman right there, Kalpana Chavla, was on Columbia in 2003 when we had the accident. I remember exactly where I was, just like many of you remember where you were when certain things happened in life. I was on the way home from, it was a Saturday morning, on the way home from the gym. My son called me on the telephone and said, turn on the TV, something's wrong with the space shuttle. Anyway, long story short, is we lost Columbia and all, lost all the astronauts uh, uh, on board there. And what happened was, if you remember that video I showed you with the hot plasma outside, we were going so fast that the air ionizes, you got this hot plasma. Their thermal protection system had a hole in a very, very small hole, very small. They estimate the width of a quarter, maybe. That's enough to allow that hot gas to get inside of the structure. And the hot gas is hot enough to just slice through the structure of the vehicle, um, and that destroyed it. But that's a sad day. You know, really lost. That was really one of the saddest days I can remember. I, I've lost contemporaries flying Navy airplanes. I can remember sitting in the ready room one night before launching on a Navy mission and sitting closer to a pilot than I'm sitting to you. Never saw that person again. He fall in the water and they're gone. But that's kind of different. It's military. This is scientific. You're not supposed to have things happen, but bad things do happen, and that's what. And so it was really, it was a dangerous job, and uh, it was just a real sad day for me. But it, it's it's worth it. You know, no progress is ever made without risk and without sacrifice and without bad things happening. And uh, to young people in the audience, I don't ever want you to grow up being afraid of trying new things. Okay, life is about doing bold, exciting things. So don't ever be afraid of trying something new and different. All right, we have a saying, no guts, no glory. So you want to see you want to do something? Go for it. Don't ever be afraid. Yes. Is it hard to turn on the systems, charge them? fly in and out of space. You say, is it hard? I don't think of it as being hard. I think of it as being challenging and fun. So yes, you have to work at it, you have to study, you have to learn, you spend a lot of time, but it's challenging, but the reward is so much fun because you get to do such cool things. It's just amazing. So absolutely. And uh, I remember when I was your age, my parents used to tell us if something is easy, it's probably not worth doing. So do the things that are tough, that are difficult and challenging, and you'll really enjoy it. Yeah. Where are we? Where else? Hi, Captain Scott. Hi. Thank you so much for coming out. We've had a really good, fun evening tonight. Thank you. My question is, could you reflect for just a minute on some of your mentors and some of the people who helped you get to where you got to go? 
Yes, yeah, somebody asked me a question early this afternoon in one of the faculty meetings about my mentors. My first mentors were my parents. Remember that picture I showed you with my, old, old, with my family, that old picture back there? Yeah, you know, you see, so, you see so many things in the news today about broken homes and single parent homes and no African American fathers and all that. All my friends had two parents in the home. That's no big deal. My dad was in the home, my mom was in the home, and they worked and they, they uh, guided us and they made sure that we knew education was the key. You know, the Scott kids had to do homework every night. We knew education was number one. We knew we were all going to college. So my parents my, were my first mentors. And other mentors were teachers. I talked about a teacher by the name of Mr. Franklin Clark at my elementary school. And then another teacher, my band director in high school, was one of my mentors. My band director in high school made a personal phone call to Florida State University. I always have to say, go Knowles, for those who are in the <laughs> audience. Doesn't matter which university, it happened to be FSU. And his personal phone call got me into FSU. FSU introduced me to engineering, which got me into the Navy and astronaut corps. So I've had a number of people to mentor me along the way, and, uh, and, and that's important because none of us uh, accomplish anything alone. We all have to have people to help us. Those of us who are adults my age, our job is to mentor young people. And young people, your job is to do the best you can and look for others to mentor you. So I've had a number of mentors along the way, some in and out of the Navy, in the neighborhood and out of the neighborhood and so on. So very fortunate. Uh, I have two questions. You have two? Dude, only one to a customer. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm just joking. Go ahead. What's your question? I know you were kidding. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and the, uh, the first question is, what did the G's feel like? When the you G's like feel like your body weighs several times its normal weight. You feel really, really, really heavy. You try and lift your arms up and they're heavy. You try and lift your head up and it's heavy. Everything feels really, really heavy. That's what the G's feel like. Well, I weigh more than 50 pounds. <laughs> and my second question, what was the scariest thing in space? Scary? Scariest thing in space. Scary? Moi? I wasn't afraid of anything. Huh? What about were you entering the atmosphere? <laughs> nah. Or launching? No, it was exciting. I don't think I didn't think of it as being, as being scary, and fortunately, nothing happened that frightened us. But uh, no, it was exciting for me, riding up there, doing the spacewalks, coming back, catching the satellite. All of that was very, very exciting. So again, don't I don't think of things as really? being scary. Yeah. <laughs> I like this guy. Sign him up. All right. You have a question for me? What's the question? I'll tell you what. You tell me and I'll ask it for you. Um, so when you're out doing your spacewalk, what type of eye protection do you wear when you are, when the sun side of the earth is where What type of what? You got to speak. Eye protection? Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. I don't have a. The helmet outside has a couple of visors. When you're on the dark side of the orbit, you have a clear visor. Clear meaning it also filters out uh, uh, ray, you know, some radiation, residual radiation. But on the light side of the orbit, right under the sun, you have a, a colored visor. The visor is coated with pure gold. It is a very, very thin layer of absolutely pure gold. That you, and it, it's thin enough that you can see through. It shades you from the brightness of the sun and also protects you from the ultraviolet radiation and so on. You have never seen bright until you've seen the sun from space because you're not looking through 50 miles of atmosphere. When you, when you see the sun, it is incredibly bright. And everything else is incredibly clear, looking at the moon and the stars and so on, because again, you're not looking through 50 miles of atmosphere. So yeah, now, and also along with your question, the space shuttle itself, the windows, there were three pane windows. So you had an impact pane, you had a uh, impact pane, you had a heat thing, a thermal pane, and then a uh, pressure pane in, under, underneath it. So three panes, and they all had a, 
uh, function, and they also have to filter out the ultraviolet radiation and so on. But yeah, you need that eye protection, but pure gold, you could hawk that visor. That's right, you figure out how to get one down in the pawn shop because it's pure, pure gold colored visor. <laughs> What did it feel like the first time going into space? What it really felt like was cool because you're weightless and you fly every place you need to go. I'm walking back and forth across this stage, but in, in space, you float. You just push yourself off one wall and you float across the room. You have to reach out and stop yourself on the other wall. So it's a lot of fun because you fly and turn flips and all like Superman, but it's also uncomfortable because your body has to get used to it. And uh, in continuous weightlessness, everything moves upward. Your, body, your spinal column stretches out a little bit. You get taller. Your back hurts a little bit. Fluids move upward in your head. You get a little bit of sinus aches and headaches. Also, things in your stomach sort of float upward a little bit. And it's uncomfortable until you get used to it. Once you get used to it, then you feel normally. But it's really amazing experience. Uh, Captain Scott. The, one of your future astronauts would like to know how long did it take to go around the Earth? In the it takes 90 minutes, take an hour and a half to completely go around the Earth. So that's really fast. Yeah, every hour and a half. We see the sun rise and set 16 times every 24 hour period of time. You can actually watch the sun come up over. Actually, you're moving, but you're moving so fast the sun comes up and then 45 minutes later, it sets behind you. And it's dark, 45 minutes later, it comes up again. So every, every 90 minutes. Thank you. Yeah. I did have two, but you answered one already. So is there a star that's smaller than Earth or the same size? I, I can hear your voice. Sometimes the, with the echo, say it one more time back in a second. Is there a star that is either the same size or smaller than Earth? Is there a star that is the same size Oh, a size star that is the same size or smaller than Earth? Yeah, I'm sure there are. There's stars of all kinds of different sizes out there, so I'm sure there are others that are the size or smaller than Earth. Uh, the moon is not really a star, but the moon is smaller than the Earth. And the moon, you may know this, the moon is gravity is like one-sixth of Earth its mass. Mars is like one-third of Earth. The sun itself is a star. The sun is about a million times bigger than Earth. So there's stars of all different sizes and uh, all different masses. Interesting thing about the sun that we don't think about, use your imagination. Obviously, the sun is hot. You can't go to the sun. But just use your imagination. If you could fly to the sun, you couldn't land on it. It's not ground, earth. It's not dirt like the earth. The sun is just a ball of gas. You just fly right through it. Just a big burning ball of gas. So yes, stars come in all sizes and all, all masses. In terms of fear. Can't, can't hear you. In terms, in terms of fear. Uh, when you were retrieving the satellite, you mentioned something about vertigo. Yes. Did you actually suffer vertigo? Yes. And how did you, how did you feel? And yeah. how did you combat it? Yeah, vertigo is spatial disorientation. When you, and, and for those who, who it's, it's kind of hard to understand if you haven't experienced it. Pilots experience vertigo when you're flying in conditions where you can't see outside. You're flying in instrument conditions in clouds or bad weather, and you can't see the ground. You, you, it's when your body feels as though it's in one position when it's really in another position. Vertigo, it can be very dangerous. And as a pilot learning to fly instruments in the Navy, we were taught that when you have vertigo, you have to sort of tune out your feelings. You ignore what your body is telling you. That's very difficult to do. And trust your instruments. Your instruments give you the right information, so just ignore your body. Well, when we were doing that satellite capture and we were standing there and all of a sudden we began to rotate the shuttle and the earth out of the corner of my eye began to tilt like this. When the earth tilts, if you feel as though you're falling. When the earth tilts, you're falling, right? That's what happens. 
Well, instinctively, I tried to catch myself and right myself. Well, I couldn't do that. I'm attached to the shuttle. The earth continued to tilt, and I'm getting this disorientation. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, how, how are we going to handle that? And then I thought back to flight training when they said, ignore your feelings and trust your instruments. Then I thought, I don't have any instruments up here. But then I thought, it's taking me longer to tell it than to think through it. All of a sudden, I realized, I said, wait a minute, the satellite is stable. It's not going anywhere. I just focused all my attention on the satellite, and I sort of tuned out my feelings, focused everything on the satellite, and then as you see in the picture, the Earth was this way to us, but we were able to manipulate, catch the satellite, put it in there. So my Navy training came into effect there and uh, overcame that vertigo, and we caught that satellite. Really interesting. Yes, where are we? What happens when one of you in space gets sick? Well, fortunately, we haven't had anybody get seriously ill. Astronauts are pretty healthy people, so they select people who are not likely to get sick. If you have a very, very minor illness, then you treat it. If you happen to cut yourself, and cuts don't heal as well, blood doesn't coagulate as well up there as they do down here, but you can bandage it. If you got a headache, you take Tylenol. If somebody were to get seriously injured, you have to do an emergency deorbit, stabilize them, and, and do an emergency come home to get them some treatment. So as we begin to spend more and more time in space, like we build a permanent colony on the moon, you're gonna have to have medical facilities up there. We send people off to Mars, you're gonna have to have medical facilities and medical doctors. Oh, every, each, each crew has a person on there that's designated as the medical person. On my first flight, we actually had a doctor on board. So naturally the doctor would be our medical officer. On my second flight, we didn't have a medical doctor, so our commander was designated as the medical person, and he was taught how to give shots. We all had CPR training, and we have a medical kit, you have medicine. You're always in touch with the ground, and there's a flight surgeon, a real doctor on console to talk with you and advise you. But if anything ever went seriously wrong, you'd have to do an emergency due orbit and come home. Hi. Hi. I have two questions. Okay. Um, first. About how many full-time people would you say worked on this mission in order to get you into space? On, you mean full to everywhere, all over the world? Yes. Oh, goodness, in the thousands? Yeah. Each, each space shuttle mission employed thousands of people to get only six people in orbit. Because you've got the ground console people, you've got all the engineers and scientists, all the, all the technicians. Uh, you've got people around the world supporting it because you're orbiting. So you have people in other countries that are also supporting the missions. You have people who, who uh, prepare the mission and, uh, up front and then they're done. You have people who recover on the end and they're done. So overall, there are thousands of people that support the mission. And people also, like you don't think of, like the people who take care of the space center, the groundskeepers, the custodians, the cooks, the laundry people, the security force, gotta have security. You know, the weather people, the meteorologists, the Air Force supports it. You know, the Navy with ships out there supporting to pick up the solid rocket boosters. And the, so thousands of people support every mission. Yeah. Um, also, what do you see as the future of space travel and what do you think will be future purpose for new missions? Well, the, I think the future, and it's slow to come, but it is coming, is uh, put people back on the moon this time for scientific reasons, a permanent base, then send people off to Mars. Okay, Mars is a ways away, but it's gonna come at some point. At the same time, you have the private commercial companies that are making it affordable, like SpaceX is one of them. Also a company called Virgin Galactic, but Virgin's gonna be doing space tourism. So in just a few years, I expect to see Virgin launching people on suborbital tourist flights, and then later on, they'll launch orbital tourist flights and so on. So you're going to have NASA, I think, government programs uh, pushing the cutting edge. The government programs will be collaborative. You have not just the U.S., but the U.S. working with Russia and with European space agency, the Asians, and so on, doing cutting edge stuff. Then you have private commercial companies going, coming behind and making it cost effective. So I think the future of space flight is very bright. I always tell students, don't be discouraged. You know, if you're interested in space program, go for it, because it's not going to die. We will continue to grow, continue to push, and more and more people will, begin to, will be able to participate. Do they got any other life out there besides Earth? 
One more time. Do they got life besides Earth out there? Do they have life? Do I believe there's life out there someplace? No, no like, like, I would say other beings besides us. Okay, it's hard to, sometimes with the echo back and forth, it's hard to understand what you're saying. Yes, he's asking, is there other life besides what's on Earth? Other well, other beings? we don't know. How many of you think there's life someplace else in the universe? All right, yeah, I think so. Because of the sheer numbers, I believe in the odds, with billions and billions and billions of planets out there, there's bound to be life someplace else. I mean, nowhere in the world we could be the only planet in the universe with life. So I, I agree, I think there's life someplace else. Yes. All right. How does it feel like when you land off the plane? Well, how did it feel when I get off the plane? I felt very, very, very heavy. It was very difficult to walk because I just felt so heavy. And also my balance was thrown off a little bit because I couldn't walk very well. It takes a little while to get used to, get used to being back. Of which plane that you like go on, which one do you think is more comfortable? Well, they both were about the same. Endeavor was the newest. Columbia was old, but they were all, they were both really, really pretty comfortable. It's like having an old car that you take really, really good care of and you have a, a new car. They're both very comfortable and they'll both work real well. At what point does science become spiritual for you? And what, I, I, don't, I don't think that science ever became spiritual. I don't think you can fly in space and not have it affect, your, affect you in one way or another. And the way it affected me was realizing how small the Earth is. I always tell the audience that the Earth is so small and so fragile from space, and it's so insignificant because when you look out past the Earth and you see either all that vast blackness or other planets and stars, you realize this little planet unbe uh, uh, beneath you is so insignificant. It's, it's significant to us because it's home, but in the total scheme of the universe, it's meaningless. And we're gonna take care of it and do something uh, uh, to see that it survives we're in deep trouble because the rest of the universe doesn't care about us. They could do away with this little small speck of dust and it wouldn't be a big deal. So uh, that's one thing I noticed from space. And also I like to tell people how, uh, the, about the contrast. If I turn on the news every day and I'm bombarded by news just like you are, all the news is negative and ugly. If you listen to the news, the whole world is about to e erupt and explode because there's so much ugliness going on, but from space, it looks so peaceful and quiet. And uh, you can't see boundaries. You can't see where one country starts and the other one stops. And you can't see what religion these group of people are and what color these people are. And you just don't have any of that. It just looks so peaceful and so beautiful and so quiet. So it gives you a different perspective on things. and. Uh, when you come back, I think you, that, that affects you. You like to, you like to see uh, us get along better on Earth and take better care of it. You like uh, to see us keep the Earth clean and be environmentally friendly. That doesn't mean we can't utilize different forms of energy, but do so in a responsible manner. And uh, you just like to see just people just not be so ugly oh. to each other the way you see it down here. I was talking to, uh, I was telling one group of people earlier tonight, I, one of the, the ensemble, I, I direct one of the uh, music ensembles at Florida Tech. There's six people in the ensemble, and we were talking the other night about uh, Fergie's, con remember when Fergie just sang the national anthem? And you know, her, her rendition didn't come off too well. And that's okay. But the news just kept beating her and pounding her in the head with it. Everywhere you look, they were talking about how horrible her rendition is. So the students were laughing and talking about how bad she sounded. And I'm, and I'm saying to them, hey, you know, the thing that bothered me was how ugly people treated her. And they said, what do you, what do you mean by that? I said, well, how would you feel if you were on a performance 
and your performance didn't go. That happened because of my perspective. And Questions, and then we're going to close out our evening. Captain Scott, good evening. Good evening. Um, thank you for sharing this wealth with us tonight. I have so many questions I want to ask well, you. Well, thank you. Uh, um, I really want to acknowledge you for being an elder, a leader, um, just such a monumental figure in our society. So okay. thank you for now, paving the way. Now I'm elder and monumental. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> just looking at the diversity of the flight crew. I have to ask, how was it being a black man in space? You know what? And, and uh, I, I like this because it's a funny thing. When you get past all that color and stuff, it, 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 it all disappears. On my first flight, there was a Japanese astronaut. His name was Koichi, Koichi Wakata. When I first met Koichi, I didn't know him, so the first thing was, okay, this, and I'm trying to remember, okay, this is Koichi. Koichi's from Japan. But as we got to know each other, it was no longer Koichi from Japan, it was just Koichi. And on my second flight, it was Leonid Kadenyuk from the Ukraine. Well, as I got to know him, it was no longer Leonid from the Ukraine, it was just Leonid. It was no longer KC from India, it was just KC. So when you get to know people, all of those differences disappear. They mean nothing. You don't even think about it. I suspect that when they first met me, they were trying to think, okay, who is that? Well, that's Winston. He's the African-American guy. But as we got to know each other, it was just Winston. I got a chance to meet Colonel Young Li Wei, who was the first Chinese taikonaut. We ate dinner together, and we had to talk through an interpreter. But as I got to know him, I found out he and I are just alike. He was a military pilot. I'm a military pilot. He had a young son. I had a young son. He likes to fly airplanes. I like to fly airplanes. He flew in space. So the answer to your question is all that stuff disappears if we just are broad-minded and open-minded enough to allow it to disappear. And once I got to orbit, nobody cared what color I was. As a matter of fact, somebody wrote an article after we got back from that flight, and it was an African-American journalist, and they wrote an article about us catching the satellite, and they criticized NASA for not advertising the fact that the person that went out there and directed the catch was African-American. They wanted to criticize NASA. NASA didn't care anything about what color you are. All NASA cared about was getting its satellite back. That's all they care about. So I think where I'm going from this, I, I, can, I can stand here and talk about issues and ob uh, obstacles that I overcame. I could name things for you that happened to me and during my lifetime as an African-American, even during my astronaut days. I could list things, but I prefer not to do that because I think we need to spend more time looking forward than we look back. And I think sometimes we do ourselves a disservice by spending so much time looking back. Now, I'm African-American, so I can obviously talk about the African-American part, but the rest of it goes to everybody else. So it goes to women, Hispanics, Jewish people, goes to everybody. African-Americans do us kids a disservice because we spend so much time talking about what bad has happened to us and how people won't let us do things. I think we need to spend more time just saying, do it. Just do it. Okay. All that other stuff aside, I, I, do, I do not like the I suffered more than you did game. Everybody suffered. Yeah, we, we suffered. I can, I can, again, I can point to things that happened, but okay, get me started. <laughs> Where are we? All right. Hi, Captain Strong. Uh, so I had a really uh, deep question I wanted to ask. Uh, one's you finish with the job that you're doing right there out of space, how do you like entertain yourself? Do you have like space games? Uh, you play cards, <laughs> you make bets. Like what, what do you, how do you, how do you get, how do you make fun? Now that was a, that was a real deep question. So I'm, I'm gonna give you a real deep answer. The way, the way you entertain yourself is playing in zero gravity. I'm trying to make this short. We just watched the Olympics. We had Olympics in space. 
So representing the United States was Steve Lindsay. What we did was we had Steve lot, spread him out horizontally in space, weightless, and then we spun him. So he's spinning around, and we counted the number of turns he spun. Then, representing the Ukraine was Leonid Kadinia. We spread him out vertically, and we spun him, and we counted the number of turns he spun around. Representing India was K.C. Chavla. We spun her in space, and we counted the number of turns before she stopped, and K.C. won our Olympics. <laughs> so what you do in space is you make up all kind of games to play. Kids, mom tells you, don't play with your food. Is that right? Does mom tell you, don't play with your food? When you get to be an astronaut, you can play with your food. Because we go up there and we play with candies and foods and stuff. So. I was just wondering, like, what's your opinion on single stage to orbit crafts like Venture Star or any other uh, craft that you're wondering? Well, uh, remember, I have an echo your... coming back at me. One more time so I can understand. Like, what is your opinion on single stage to orbit air, um, spacecrafts like Venture Star? or any other spacecraft, even, even uh, SpaceX's uh, uh, why, don't you, why don't you just come, come up here so I can. He's asking your opinion on single stage orbit aircraft. Oh, oh okay, yeah. Well, single stage to orbit aircraft are, uh, are good in some ways, and what you see is those, uh, single stage orbit is good if you can accomplish it. Accomplishing single stage to orbit depends on what you're trying to take up there. Everything is weight. Is, is weight dependent. The heavier payloads typically will have, have multiple stages. And you probably know this already. The lighter payloads you can do with single stage. But uh, what Elon Musk is doing is real good, but he's taking really, really light payloads in orbit. And his Falcon 9 is supposed to be 140,000 pounds, not fully loaded with a, with a full rocking hour. So it's a little bit, uh, a little bit too. Single stage to orbit is safer. It's easier, it's cheaper, but it doesn't have as much payload capability. If you're taking heavy loads in the orbit, 50,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds, you typically need multiple stages. So my answer is yes, I like single stage to orbit where it can be accomplished. What we're gonna probably wind up doing before we go off long duration is actually build our ship in orbit, and you know this. We'll probably build a station in orbit. We'll probably build a manufacturing station in orbit, build our ship up there so that we can launch from space. The, the heaviest part, the, the most difficult part, is getting off the ground up into orbit. Once you get this, a lot easier. Analogy, you're pushing your child on the swing. It takes a lot of energy to get them going. Once you get them going, you can stand with one hand. Just do that. Keep them going. Rockets are the same way. The heaviest part is just get from the Earth up there. Once you're up there, it's much less power. So I hope that kind of answers your question. And our last question. One more? Okay. Oh, good evening. So I have one question, but I'm, you, because I'm just going to ask this because you might know the answer. So did, oh, sorry. did NASA found another planet who can support life? I'm, I'm sorry, I have a hard time oh. hearing and understanding. Did, did, Na NASA, did NASA do what? Found another planet who can support life. Oh, NASA found another planet that can support life. NASA has identified more than one other planet that's Earth-like that could possibly support life. There's been no evidence that life is there yet, but there have been other planets with similar mass and similar size and similar composition as Earth. And of course, we base everything by what we know here on Earth. So the answer is yes, but what we don't know is whether or not there's life there or not. So. All right, am I out of time? Folks, can we give Captain Scott another All hand? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Right. And uh, Captain Scott, just a small token of our appreciation uh, from Seminole State and a couple of trinkets in the bag. We have a Raiders magnet. A, uh, <laughs> a nice thermal, you'll appreciate oh, thermal I'll part, appreciate right? that, absolutely. As well as a little techie set for you. And uh, we certainly appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. As I mentioned uh, to everyone, uh, students, uh, you're welcome to join Captain Scott out here in the foyer for a few more minutes. Also, Derek Dimitri from our planetarium has brought over a couple of telescopes 
So if you guys would like to get a view of the night sky, they're going to be set up outside here as well. And uh, one more round of applause for Captain Thank Scott. You. Thank you again Thank for coming out and sharing and with thank us. Thank you very much.